Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, we've got lots of people joining us today. So everyone, um, just so you're aware, um, everyone who is on will be muted. Um, and um, we'll open up the conversation to everyone once we, um, at the, uh, after the presentation is done, uh, we'll open up people's microphones so that we can have a joint discussion. Um, so, um, I, my name is Ellen Walter. Um, I am from IRC, and um, I am your uh, host and facilitator for our discussions and conversations today. Um, so, please, um, if you haven't already, take a moment and add your name and organization into the chat box. Um, we've got um, the webinar today should run um, approximately about an hour and a half or so, um, depending on how long we choose to have our discussion. Um, if for some reason you um, are having difficulties, please type that also in the chat box um, and we'll have someone respond to you. Um, so again, I'm Ellen Walter, um, I'm from IRC and you are joining the Monitoring Systems Change um, webinar. So, We'll have um, an opportunity um, during the end of the webinar today for you to talk a little bit about um, what it is that you're doing um, around monitoring systems change. Um, can someone chat? Um, great. So um, if you're having difficulty hearing me, um, and we'll type this in the chat box also, that if you're having difficulty, please leave the meeting and rejoin. Um, sometimes that, that's what's needed. So, so at the end of the presentation that will be by Harold Lockwood, there'll be an opportunity for us to talk about and to hear from you what it is that you're working on in regard to systems change. So um, just for everyone's information, we're recording this session um, so that, and it will be available after the fact. Um, so, um, I would encourage all the participants throughout the discussion is to also keep an eye on the chat box so that if there are interesting discussions that you want to contribute to, um, you're able to do that via the chat box. Um, we will also be capturing the chat box and that information will be available afterwards. Um, as I said, everyone will be muted throughout the presentation, but we'll open that for the Q&A and the discussion portion of the webinar. Um, and if you have any questions specifically during Harold's presentation, um, please type those in the chat box and we'll try to also address them um, during the Q&A session. The structure for the webinar, um, we'll have a, a presentation from Harold Lockwood, and I'll give you his, his bio and an overview of who he is in just a moment. Um, but we'll start with the presentation, a uh, brief presentation, um, just introducing things um, uh, that I will do, and then Harold will take over um, and give you uh, an overview of um, some landscaping that he did. Um, and. Just to clarify, and he'll do this, I'm sure, as well, that um, it may not be um, absolutely everything, and there may be, it was a very quick snapshot, and so please just note that if there are changes um, to the content of what he's presenting, um, we were, we'll be able to address those after the fact, but the main purpose of this webinar is to really start and have an open discussion about why um, we need to be monitoring for systems change and what are some ways that we can start to discuss how to go about that and coordinate more effectively. So, moving on. Wow. Okay, so why are we having this webinar now? Um, the events, and there has been a, a number of events and meetings and discussions that have been happening, um, and there has been some organizations that have started to think about how it is that they're responding to the sustainable development goals. Um, they've started to think about shifts in their strategies um, and, um, and their approaches to how they're doing monitoring. 
Um, there have been global discussions around the SWA collaborative behaviors and with the um, joint monitoring program um, about how um, about how we're going to start to measure the SDGs. And there have been a, an enormous amount of bilateral conversations and small group discussions among groups such as Agenda for Change and the partners within that, um, and bilateral conversations between organizations um, through learning projects such as the Sustainable um, Wash Systems um, Project Initiative from um, uh, USAID, and um, and uh, through other discussions with UNICEF around Washington enabling environment. So there have been an enormous amount of discussions happening, um, but a lot of those um, discussions, uh, as I mentioned, are happening um, bilaterally or in small groups. And so there's an opportunity, now is the time, as we start to look at um, the implementation of things like systems change, how are we really going to monitor that over time? Um, there's a huge diversity of actors, um, actors at the global level, having discussions about how all countries are going to be monitoring um, at the national level, um, uh, discussions with government about what this looks like and, and shifts towards systems change and at the district level. So building on that momentum and building on building on um, the building on the SWA collaborative behaviors, um, where we want to be moving from attribution, so you know, direct attribution of each of our own individual um, activities in the mon in the work that we're doing, to more of contribution towards the SDGs. So as we do that, we need to be thinking about how are we going to monitor that and demonstrate progress um, and building that evidence that something that we're actually doing something in changing the system and um, making sure that that evidence is available also to donors so that there is um, and there are shifts towards um, not only sustainability, um, a funding for sustainability, but also funding really for our systems change. So we expect this to be the first of many conversations um, and now um, at the end of this, we'll have um, an open discussion and we'll um, be sending a follow-up survey to everyone who, who joined um, to be thinking about how um, and the most effective ways for us to continue this conversation going forward. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Harold Lockwood. He's the director of Agua Consult. Um, he's an expert in water supply and sanitation with over 25 years of experience, primarily focused on the rural subsector in areas of institutional reform and sector policy development, decentralization of governance functions, service delivery arrangement, and many more topics. Um, so Harold, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Ellen. Um, as the slides get transitioned, hopefully you'll be able to see this, and I assume that you can also hear me unless I now Sharing my screen, I assume that you can all see and hear me unless I see otherwise in the chat box. So thank you, Ellen, uh, for that introduction. And I'd like to say from the outset that this presentation or the work behind it was was also done to a large extent by Claire Allalee, whose name appears on this opening slide. And Claire was an intern with us here at Agri Consult and has had to travel today so she's left uh, the UK and she's off to her new uh, chapter in her life so Claire did a lot of work on the background analysis so just to recognize her and thanks for, for her inputs. I'll talk for about 20 minutes and I'll have four broad parts to this presentation. The first building a bit on what Ellen started to outline in the opening slides around the global context and the changing context for WASH, how, I, how we see it or how I see it and the logic of what we mean by, by monitoring systems change and why it's become important and why are we having these kind of discussions. And then the next section will look at the empirical findings, you know, what did we actually see and hear, uh, what did we look at in the, uh, in the review of these various monitoring frameworks. And then some analysis and reflection on those findings around commonalities, trends, and so on. And then finally, looking at implications, uh, what does this mean in the, in the bigger picture terms of things, uh, and some conclusions about the way forward. 
I see some people can can't hear, but um, Ellen or another organizer, if you could just chat, put in the chat box whether you can hear. Need to minimize go to window. How's that? Um, so why is this important in a bit on the changing context that I mentioned? I think it's fair to say that over the last 10 to 15 years, we have seen a shift, a transition, whether you want to call it a paradigm shift or a <clears throat> transition, really from what we would say came previously, this focus on infrastructure delivery to more about thinking of services. So the delivery of services and the planning, the investments, the regulation, and indeed the monitoring of service delivery that's required. Uh, and that's particularly true, although not exclusively, for non-utility water uh, and non-sewage sanitation um, approaches, both in rural and peri-urban areas. So we have seen this shift. I think it's fundamental shift in, in thinking more globally uh, in, in our sector. And this, as Ellen uh, pointed to, is reflected in the transition from the MDGs to the SDGs and how the new SDGs are articulated and framed around universality and around sustaining uh, services over time and that requires all of us I think to have a, a, a real step change in in our in our thinking and how we approach uh, our work in support of investments and a lot of the drivers for moving towards systems thinking have come about partly because the previous types of approaches more linear more conventional type approaches to deliver delivering sustained benefits have not really worked that well and it's not just in our sector but it's in other sectors as well such as the health sector education sector and outside of development in the UK for example in the health sector systems thinking is is really embedded uh, in, a, in a more mainstream way so that's a bit about the the background uh, thinking now more specifically on our in terms of our own sector and what that means in terms of what we want to see this diagram which you should be seeing now in front of you has two sides of an equation or two two round uh, diagrams for now on the right side the green circle improve wash services that's what we want to to get to that's our goal of course better quality better reliability and so on and we we know that that's the end state we want to arrive at and of course then that has knock on impacts in terms of improved health livelihoods etc um, and the logic has been, as I mentioned, that um, we delivered aid and investments by national governments directly to try and improve those services on the ground. Um, with this shift towards thinking about systems, and this is not necessarily brand new as of now, but this has been, you know, people have been working on this for some time. It's more about putting more emphasis on supporting the WASH system strengthen the wash system so the blue circle on the left hand side of the equation uh, which we know is made up of factors like governance the financing policy and so on and including monitoring which if we can strengthen that the logic goes then we will lead to a, an improved improved wash services and outcome so that's the sort of new way of looking at uh, how we should be strengthening systems and why it's important and we know then that the wash systems that we're concerned with are quite difficult to engage with they're complicated they're made up of uh, actors different people working institutions working different factors in place capacities uh, all influenced and all working in a dynamic way uh, within a boundary whether that's local or national or even global you could argue um, so to try and engage with that and and improve it is not an easy task and there's almost a leap of faith still because I think we're still not at the stage of having truly tested this this theory that if you strengthen wash systems you'll get better wash services that's the that's the thing we're trying to to drive at and then the question of how do you measure that becomes very important which brings me to the next slide where you see on the right hand side of the equation still the desired wash services that we want to see as an end result and the wash system sitting in a broader system within a country we know that wash systems don't exist in isolation they also are influenced by broader governance issues reforms in public sector administration in a country they're they're, they're influenced by levels of socio-economic development by politics 
Uh, there are trends around urbanization and decentralization. All of these have an influence on that uh, wash system as such. When we're coming to thinking about the actual monitoring, we already have in place, and I would argue that we've had in place for some time, tools, approaches, frameworks, whatever you want to call them, to measure what's going on on that right-hand side of the equation. So are wash services being improved? We have simple functionality. We have various service level frameworks that have been tried and tested. We have sustainability checks and so on. So we, we pretty much know how to do that side of the equation in terms of monitoring, are we seeing a change? Where we are still feeling our way, I would say, is that uh, the, the, the left-hand side of the equation, how do we measure, how do we define and measure the strength of a WASH system? Now, some people have been working on, on uh, building block frameworks, political economy analysis, but this is where we're really getting now to the nub of, uh, of this work that we've done, this landscaping, and why we're having this discussion on this webinar more broadly. It's really around how do we carry out this kind of system change monitoring. And, and there has been work done on this. You know, there's, there's, there's work that's been going on for some time, notably a paper commissioned by WaterAid in the UK uh, and carried out by Heather Skilling about a year ago, looking at how donors view systems thinking and system approaches and indeed monitoring. And, and that paper is, is very usefully points to a number of um, different ways that donors are interpreting systems change and their approaches to, to monitoring. So I recommend that you read that paper if you haven't done already. So that's a bit of the background, the logic of why it's important or why we're looking at this, this topic. So to introduce the landscaping we did, this rapid landscaping, the diagram at the bottom there is just an example of one of the tools that's been used in the past. This is the, the um, service delivery assessment tool, the old CSO, which I'm sure some of you will be very familiar with. Um, we did this la rapid landscaping, as Ella mentioned, and we looked at only at development partner frameworks. Uh, we know there are other frameworks out there, so again, uh, if you know of them, please, you know, let's let's have that information, let's share that information. And we started with about 20 examples and focused down on 13 from these this initial larger number. And what we really wanted to do is to look at the scope of these frameworks or these monitoring tools how they're designed, how they've been applied and used, and particularly what they're trying to look at and measure. So the, the areas of monitoring, the dimensions uh, or factors, and there are various terms used to describe these different um, components of a, of a framework. And then we carried out some simple analysis to see, well, are there common elements? What are the gaps? Uh, and this was done, uh, as I say, in, in a fairly rapid way, and, and we didn't have a lot of resources to throw at this. So this is just the first uh, rough, pass. Here I hope you can see the next slide which is a rather detailed um, table showing the 13 different frameworks with the uh, the developers of the frameworks on the left and the abbreviations for the tools. So very briefly running through those you had the sustainability index tool by uh, developed by USAID, uh, a, a building block framework which is still being piloted and rolled out by IRC of the Netherlands. You have the enabled environment framework of UNICEF which is actually more of a toolbox of, of tools itself. You have the SDA which I mentioned just just briefly um, on the previous slide which was developed and used by the World Bank and WSP with its government partners. You have a new set of building blocks developed by the World Bank in a study a global study on rural water um, that's specifically looking at that subsector. We looked at TrackFin um, which I think you all, all know from WHA, the glass framework, uh, the ship flow diagram developed originally by World Bank and WSP, the washback tool of UNICEF, which is fairly um, uh, scaled up and rolled out, a fairly new framework being developed by WaterAid called the District Sustainability Tool, the WashTech TAF or Technology Applic Applicability Framework a global monitoring framework of water for people and finally the collaborative behaviors uh, framework or monitoring of the SWA. So you can see there's quite a range of different um, different stakeholders or different developers of these tools and some of these but only about a quarter were, have been applied at scale to date so only about four of these have been 
uh, applied in 30 or 40 countries or more. Um, many of them are one-off snapshots, so meaning they've only been done once, but some of them have been applied in multiple uh, multiple countries over time. So you start to build a, a series of uh, trend lines, let's say. Wars for People particularly have been monitoring in all of their nine countries from 2012, and they've now developed a new version, 2017. So this has been going on for some time. Most look at all of the elements of WASH, but some are only looking at certain subsectors. Ship flow diagram, uh, obviously on urban sanitation, and the building block that I mentioned from, from the World Bank that looks at rural water. And they use a mixed range of data sources. The majority do collect some kind of primary data through different means, but not all. There are a couple that rely on existing publicly available resource, particularly the WASHBAT framework and the SWA collective uh, collaborative behaviors, but they do inf they are informed by some kind of uh, existing uh, primary data collection. And most of them use some kind of scorecard or traffic light system to illustrate progress against predetermined factors or dimensions. So that's the sort of global set of frameworks that we looked at. Um, and from that, it was pretty clear pretty quickly that there was a continuum of examples between that, if you recall the diagram I showed earlier, the uh, looking at the WASH system and on one hand and looking at WASH services on the other, on the right hand side. And so those two broad categories soon emerged, uh, those that looked at enabling factors, enabling environment factors. And um, in a lot of cases, these were used as a proxy for systems change. So they, they were, were not specifically talking about systems change, but we see them as a proxy and applied either at local or national level, but tended to be more at the national level. And on the other side, looking specifically now down at the delivery of wash services and the capacity to deliver those services, mostly at local level. The slide you can now see hopefully in front of you is the same set of tools uh, with the two different dimensions divided out now between the enabling environments in the blue left hand side of the screen and the wash services under the green heading on the right hand side of the screen. So you can see there the range of different dimensions or areas that are being looked at by these tools. <clears throat> uh, the env enabling environment side, <clears throat> so looking at the blue side of the screen had eight different dimensions uh, and two-thirds of the example frameworks included at least half of those dimensions and three of the frameworks included all eight you can see that through the, the check marks there and the most commonly included the most frequently included are around financing monitoring looked at were infrastructure, asset management, water resource management and governance and institutional issues. We then carried out a very simple uh, analysis on these, just looking at the weighting of different factors across the two. And you can see in the right hand uh, two columns, you have red and green and yellow uh, simply representing the, the, the percentage uh, in terms of how, how many times they appeared in these two different uh, dimensions or these buckets of dimensions. And you can see that most of the frameworks or just over half of the frameworks appeared more on the enabling environment side of the equation. So that left hand side of the equation. This is really just showing a summary of the previous uh, table. Uh, where you see red, it means there are very few dimensions falling in that, uh, in the wash services side, and where it's yellow, it's more or less split half and half. So, for example, a couple of the tools looked exclusively at the enabling environment, the UNICEF framework, the enabling environment framework, and the wash bat. Um, 
but and some of them looks at both. So the USAID SITS looks at both, and the WaterAid District Sustainability Analysis Tool also looks at both. Um, it's important. It was also evident that the enabling environment mainly focused on factors rather than institutions or actors within a system and their relationship. So it was fairly static and looking at factors like financing institutions and so on. And that brings me in, if some of you were looking carefully, you'd see that the SWA Collective Behaviours Framework is not on this second table. Uh, and we thought that this is one of the most interesting or one of the few examples that was trying to assess part of, in part at least, the dynamics between institutions, uh, between governments and development partners principally, rather than only factors in the enabling environment. So we, we thought that, that was an interesting one to take a bit of a closer look at. Um, and if some of you are familiar with the SWA, you'll know that it's a global uh, partnership, uh, accountability flat platform, and it has a couple of different main elements linked to monitoring, one of which is the collaborative behaviours, this set of four behaviours which are considered important for strengthening uh, the SWASH system in a country. This uh, monitoring has been started, it's been, as I understand, as we understand, it's been applied in uh, 38 countries as a one-off exercise but not yet fully released. Uh, it relies on data from mainly reported via the glass, but there are also major challenges with data. So that's one of the key findings that's come out very early on. And it monitors the following four sets of collective behaviors. The first is around government leadership. The second is around use of national systems, national country processes and systems. The third is around uh, having one common information and accountability platform. And the last one is about financing strategies. So those are the four behaviors it looks at. And these are published in the form or reported in the form of country uh, profiles. You can see a cover page there on the right hand side of the screen, an example from Bangladesh. We managed to get hold of three of these and um, looking at the, the different behaviors on this next table, you'll see them listed down the left hand side, one to four. And you'll see the three countries, Ethiopia, Kenya and Haiti. and the scoring that's given with the the different uh, numbers of stars that's how the the top line is shown and you'll see immediately that there's that there's insufficient data reported by all of the development partners so immediately that generates uh, a, 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 a point of engagement around um, whether or not development partners are are sharing data maybe it's not available maybe they're not sharing it and you can see that, that that's a, a critical gap. And these country profiles are meant to be a starting point for engagement between government and development partners, and as indeed a mutual accountability tool. So looking then just a little bit more detail, the Haiti uh, collect collaborative behavior number three, you'll see that um, there's an indicator here around government-led multi-stakeholder review mechanisms. So this is one of three other there's three other uh, indicators with each one with sub indicators that collectively on aggregate gives the score that we saw in the previous slide and you can see there the government has scored or given itself or has been uh, given a score of three out of five so it's making progress on some things and not on others uh, and is partly underway uh, in in item number three so it's just a quick illustration and the the point of showing this i think is more around the fact that it starts to try and address the dynamics between stakeholders and not just looking at the, these static factors. So what does this all mean and what does it um, tell us around systems change and monitoring of systems change? The overall conclusions we came to that there are indeed uh, increasing numbers and quality of examples of how to monitor wash service delivery. That's the right hand side of the the equation. Most people are now adopting these the JMP indicators for the new SDG plus others. There is a pretty high level of convergence around the different elements of what is termed often termed the enabling environment. So you see more or less an 80% convergence, people using the same names, the same factors and so on. So it's quite striking. However, most frameworks are still focusing on these factors of a system they're often referred to as building blocks, rather than necess necessarily looking at 
the actors, the relationships, those dynamic uh, paths of influence between different actors. And we think, and this is a supposition, that perhaps because of the cost and complexity of doing these sort of full systems analyses, that taking the enabling environment as a proxy for the strength of a system is perhaps the logic behind this, that it's simply too difficult, too challenging uh, and too costly to do. Um, but the big finding, I guess, and, and the one I think that's important for us to discuss on this webinar uh, is around the fact that we didn't see any at scale experience explicitly with systems based monitoring. So that's actual tools that are that are trying to take an explicit uh, mapping, understanding of a local system, wash system, whether it's local or national, and then trying to assess its strength and change over time. So that's really the big takeaway message uh, from, from this landscaping for us. So we recognize, and this is the last slide, so I hope uh, you can still hear me. Um, we recognize that there's need for further work in this area uh, to understand systems change, perhaps to come up with quicker and cheaper and easier ways of, of assessing systems. Um, there are tools out there so far for the wash sector, they've remained rather in the academic sphere. Um, but we, we know there's a lot of interest and a lot of uh, excitement and, and um, focus coming in on this area. And one of the, the most relevant initiatives, as Ellen mentioned at the outset, is this new sustainable uh, wash systems initiative that is funded by USAID uh, and managed by UCB, the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, which is a five-year program and it has at its very heart, its very core, the aim of learning about system, wash systems and, and trying to monitor their change over time. So it's a very exciting opportunity for the sector to be able to learn from this learning initiative uh, and it specifically uses systems-based tools like network mapping, factor analysis, actor analysis and so on to try and define and understand and monitor local systems and the, the graphic you see is something from a recent publication, which just shows you the, the kind of output that these tools can, can deliver. So in closing, Ellen, I'll uh, hand back over to you. Um, it perhaps not surprising, we think it's necessary to share more experiences, have more of these kind of discussions, such as this webinar, and to uh, work on this perhaps in a more coordinated and systematic way, because there is a lot of stuff being done out there, but I think it needs to be pulled together uh, in a way which will help the future dialogue and research as we go forward. That, that's all from my side. I will now try and mute myself and hand back over to you or you'll take control. Thank you. I'll take control back. Thanks, Harold. <clears throat> um, we're gonna open right now for, um, we're, if, Harold, if you wanna just leave that slide up for just a second. Um, we're gonna open, um, of microphones. Um, so please type in the chat box if you have a question, um, uh, just for clarification, and then we're gonna open up to a larger discussion. Um, so if you have a question, please type it in the chat box. Is there any questions coming? Can everyone hear me okay? Everyone, all right, Lewis, let's open up your mic. Just hold on one second. And Susan has. Lewis, you can unmute yourself. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. <clears throat> Thanks, Carol. That was terrific. Thanks very much for that. Uh, the question I have relates to something you brought up towards the end which is what one might call the what versus the how. It seems like there's a lot of focus um, even on the enabling environment and on the systems change on the what rather than, as you pointed out, the how. And in looking at the SWA collaborative behaviors and not being a expert on those, but even though they look like they're about behaviors, they seem like they're still more about the what versus the how. So for example, I didn't see in there something about how well everybody is playing with each other in the country sandbox, if you will, how well people are actually behaving
Now, thanks, Lewis. I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think it's a start from what I know, and, and bear in mind this was a rapid review. So I think we have somebody from um, representing WHO who's working on the collaborative behavior. So I, I would certainly ask them to comment on your question. I think it's a start, and maybe it's also around this issue of cost and complexity that I brought up in terms of trying to get at the, the how question. Uh, because if you look through those collaborative behaviors, indeed, they're still looking uh, quite a lot at the what question, that there, that there are some elements in there that do give us pointers as to how well people are coordinating, how well they're participating. And I suppose over time, that would lead you to some measure of whether their behaviors are actually improving in terms of being more collaborative or not, or even slipping back and being less collaborative. Um, but, but from what, I've, what we saw, what we've seen, just having a quick look from the, the outside, uh, there's still insufficient data available to, to, to determine that. But uh, I think it would be good for somebody, I think it's Betsy, if I'm not mistaken, who is uh, from WHO, who may be able to speak to that. Ellen. Yes, Betsy, um, I will unmute your, oh, you're muted. So go ahead, Betsy, if you want to respond. Yeah. Um, so the idea behind, and I'm going to also let Claire Battle from WaterAid jump in because she was one of the people who was very involved in the development of the collaborative behaviors. But I know that within SWA, the idea is that the collaborative behaviors are the how and the building blocks are the what. And this was the first time that the WASH sector that we were aware of that has really tried to monitor these behaviors and so the indicators and the framework that we came up with was really just a first step and we're hoping to be able to capture more of the how and then specifically um, regarding the comment on how people are playing in the sandbox there are some of the indicators that look at are you in a coordination mechanism what who is involved in the coordination mechanism um, are you sharing data are you using different um are you sharing data for monitoring systems and things so i think that's what we're trying to get at is having the collaborative behaviors be a how but we realized that this was just a first step hi ellen it's claire is it okay if i leap in on on something betty betsy just said yes claire please go ahead yeah, just, I mean, uh, Betsy said it very well, but just to pick up on, on Lewis's point as well, certainly what the beha collaborative behaviors are trying to do is capture precisely this idea of are people playing together nicely? Is there good behavior? Is there bad behavior? Um, I agree that the sort of the headline bubbles of the behavior, the sort of top line titles, are still a little bit phrased as perhaps what rather than how and that's just the outcome of the sort of SWA process where you have to get 90 people to agree on wording by committee um, but I encourage you to look at the sort of the detailed indicators below those headings that Betsy's just referred to because they really do start to get more at these issues of how people are acting together. Um, they're still not perfect, um, it, it's very much a first iteration and there's an active effort at the moment to learn from what we've done and see how we can strengthen it going forward so it really does drill down precisely into these issues uh, Lewis was referring to. So um, I would encourage people to engage in those conversations through SWA. It's very much open to people who are keen to work with Betsy and I and others to, to strengthen that side of things. Um, and if it's okay, I'll just um, I'll jump in as well with my, my other questions, seeing as I have the mic. Um, uh, Harold, thanks very much for the presentation um, and, and thank you also for referencing the water aid work that was led by Heather Skilling, which was based very much on the same analysis that you, you started with um, and I would encourage people to take a read. Um, but I also wanted to emphasize that that wasn't just a one-off report. Water aid has also been actively working uh, to continue to take that conversation forward, working particularly with donors to look at how they internally report systems in a way that sort of satisfies the political pressures that go along with aid so that we can try and incentivize investments in the system alongside uh, investments in infrastructure and so on. Uh, and we came to a similar conclusion to you in that there's still a gap around this sort of capturing the dynamism. So there's a lot more focus on capturing static things and sometimes a worrying sort of 
shift towards quite a kind of checklist approach to an enabling environment that misses the key essence of systems change, which is about transition, about dynamism and so on. So what WaterAid is currently exploring is the kind of next piece of research we can do to build on Heather's work to really delve into some of that. Um, so my question was just going to be given that there are a lot of others already working on these issues, uh, conversations already ongoing and, and so on. How it, I'd be interested to hear from Ellen how IRC sees itself uh, linking up um, with others going forward so we can all make sure we're, we're working together. Thanks. Thanks, Claire. <clears throat> that's, a, that's a great question and that's part of what um, this initial discussion, that's why we're having this initial discussion. Um, I think that um, there's an opportunity for um, cross-learning and, um, and getting um, beyond just discussions um, and having more of whether it be a community of practice, practice or a way to share knowledge. Um, as, as you mentioned, IRC kind of has their foot in, a, in, in an, or toe in a lot of these different um, conversations. And so um, I think we will be sending a survey around afterwards to get um, input from actually everyone on the um, on the webinar and those even outside to find out what is the most effective way to share that information and um, to make sure that we're not duplicating efforts that we're learning from each other. So um, Claire, that's a great point, and I'm not sure you know IRC. I think um, is very uh, IRC is very interested in um, is in seeing this move forward um, and um, is very devoted to. Um, the achievement of the SDGs, not only in the countries that we work, but seeing this um, as an opportunity to influence kind of the sector and donors more widely. So, um, so we don't have the specific answer for you at the moment about you know how this is um, how the conversations and the ongoing discussions will occur, but it is something that we're um, exploring and we'll be exploring with all of you. So, um, thank you very much. Um, there's a couple of other questions. I'm going to pose one for Susan because she's in a noisy place, and then. Um, we're going to take a couple of um, questions at a time, um, and then uh, it's not um, just Harold who will respond, but there's an opportunity for um, anyone on the call to, to respond. So Susan's question is about whether or not um, systems change monitoring could be used for impact investing. Um, and then I'm going to open up the microphone for John. If you want to go ahead and um, ask your question, and then we're going to move to Katerina. Um, so she can ask her question. So John, go ahead. Hey, Ellen, thanks. Uh, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, go, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, Harold, thanks. That was a really uh, comprehensive analysis. I really enjoyed, you know, seeing the, the whole landscape. And um, I'm curious if any of these frameworks that you looked into the details of, you know, got into capacity and specifically like technical capacity um, you know, there's checking the box to say that there's a system for monitoring, you know, assets or something. But what we find when we work with governments is there's kind of a, a whole landscape of, you know, previously discarded technology systems that were too hard to use or too complicated in use. And, and there's a lack of to use them in a lot of cases. So I was wondering if, if any of them get into that kind of level of detail. Great. Um, Harold, do you want to respond? Um, well, I can, yeah, I can. I'll take John's question first because I think it's slightly more straightforward. Thanks, John. Um, yes, some of the tools definitely do go down to that sort of level of detail, if you like, um, and they're based on sets of questions, indicators, sub indicators, uh, and then oftentimes with a, well, not often, some of them use a kind of aggregation scoring so you come out with an aggregate score at the end which then gives you the overall score so particularly the USAID SIT one I know looks at capacity at that level but also the World Bank building block one but you know the tools we looked at what we were trying to pre-filter those that already looked at this bigger the broader system enabling environment whatever you want to term it so there are other tools out there that go into more detail I guess the um, the technology framework, uh, applicability framework would be another one that would have more specific questions. So there are examples and we, we pulled out the indicators so we can share that, I think Ellen, it's correct to say we can share that 
that Excel spreadsheet where we just pulled out all the different um, indicators and sub indicators so you can actually see what they're looking at individually and all these tools as far as I know are open source so you can also go and check them out yourself but the short answer is yes although with the caveat that this is quite labor intensive or can be quite labor intensive so it's often a balance between the costs and resources required to answer very specific questions against the utility of the findings that you come out with and what does it really tell you so that's another issue which i think the sector is struggling with is where is that balance where do you get that optimum point between the amount you have to invest to track these things and what it tells you which it links a little bit i think to susan's question although i would encourage others to um, jump in i'm not quite sure what susan means by impact investing um, but i think the the tools that look more specifically at systems change so the tools we're talking about under the sws initiative of usaid will do what they say they will try to monitor the impact on a system so if that's what you mean by impact investment then yes so you you hopefully or in theory will be able to see the impact of certain interventions on the change in strength of a system whether that's positive or negative and then be able to deduce that some there's been a shift now that also then links back to claire's kind of reflections on where is the incentives or where how do we try and influence donors who uh, oftentimes for very short-term political pressure reasons need to show a return on their investment and and coming up with a tool that can show the strength of a system and how it's changed over time may be quite a hard sell for donors that are being already under a lot of pressure with with austerity measures um pressure on aid budgets to come up with it in the first instance numbers you know we all know the the kind of the struggles and the challenges that we've had over the years with with that so i think yes it can measure impact of a system and the change in the strength of system but whether you know how far that's going to be useful um, and who will be listening to that and who will be looking at that is another another question but i would encourage others to to reflect also and so um lewis before i have you jump in to respond um i just um susan wrote in the chat box that um she just clarifying she means in um impact investing is the idea of getting both a financial and social environmental return on investing um and bringing um that could bring a lot more finance to the sector so um lewis i'm going to turn it over to you to um to respond to susan's question and then we're going to go to katarina for her question Okay, um, Susan, I, I think we could have an offline discussion on this at some point, but briefly a couple of points. At this point, most of the impact investing in WASH in ventures like Sanergy on the sanitation side or Safe Water Network on the water side tend to be in organizations that are trying, testing, um, hopefully at some scale, new approaches to sustainable service delivery to try to help get to the SDGs uh, with some different approaches so that uh, on the assumption that business as usual isn't going to get us there. Certainly some of the investors in those ventures want to see impact, uh, eventually want, almost all of them eventually want to see impact such as better health. It, it can be very difficult to demonstrate that um, until you reach substantial scale or until other parts of the system are also working. So, so one answer to your question is you have to differentiate between what I call the theory of action, which is what each individual venture or approach is doing, and the theory of change, which is the overall change, which is the system's change. And th that's one point. The second point is there's a time element. Um, if you're trying to be innovative, um, it will typically take a long time before that approach is adopted sufficiently to see those sorts of impact. And the third is a question that we get asked a lot about the agenda for change, which is, is this just about governments? Is this just about NGOs? And the answer is no. There's definitely room um, within the agenda for change for market-based approaches to contribute to that. and um, 
within each country and globally, um, that discussion is ongoing. Thanks, Lewis. <clears throat> um, uh, Katarina, if you want to unmute yourself um, to ask your question. Are we gonna get... Sure, thank you, Alan. Um, just first, I think just to answer also a little bit of the question of Claire on where are we working together and John, the complexity of the tools and its application at district level. I think, um, I don't know how many of you know, but in both in Ethiopia and in Uganda, a lot is happening on actually using uh, the tools to have a baseline for each of the building blocks of the system. And a lot of our uh, organizations are collaborating and doing this. Um, so yes, yeah, so they, these tools and the baselines are being used to track change over time and also to plan where in or which building block we need uh, to work to get that change to happen. Um, but that leads me to my question. anyone has any breakthrough on how to communicate in a more simple way uh, or in a different way and if we can learn something from other sectors which have also used the same the systems approach. Thank, thanks Katarina. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any responses or wants to try to take uh, yeah some kind of stab at, at responding. Um, Maybe Katarina just a reflection rather than a direct response to your question um, because as perhaps as usual we haven't maybe looked as widely as we should although Claire I think you've been looking a bit further into a health and education system but I know for example in the UK the National <coughs> Health Screen. Yeah, I think that's what Eddie was saying. We don't need the, if that's what's causing it. Okay, can you see if there, I mean, it doesn't even show the message, the error message at the top anymore here. And the ball in a way that will not put people off or confuse issues so i think you're right it's a it's a difficult balancing act to get right to say how can we start showing some of the complexities in this without sounding like we're speaking gobbledygook and trying to um confuse people but i think claire maybe you can if i recall when we spoke a couple of weeks back you you talked about looking yeah. at um, health or education maybe you could step in yeah, I mean, I guess just one quick thought. I agree very much with what you said and that it's not sort of public facing language, um, perhaps, but I do think the the global development health community is much, much more comfortable with this language than the WASH community. So, for example, if you look at the uh, uh, Universal Health Partnership website and compare it to the SWA website, the health one is, is completely framed very explicitly around our mission is strengthening health systems, um, whereas SWA is not yet comfortable with, with that language and doesn't yet sort of have the same understanding. Um, so I think uh, often with things, the health sector is a little ahead and I think um, sort of familiarity with the language of system strengthening is, is definitely a similar area. Thanks, Claire. Is that, yeah, uh, Lewis, is that you? Yeah, just just a quick thought on that. Um, I, I think we do still, to Katarina's question, I think we do still suffer from that. And, and one of the reasons it's easier in the health sector, I believe, is that they don't have a bunch of physical systems, pipes and things like that, that 
have often been referred to as systems. And it, there's just, a, the, because of there's such a large hardware and engineering component in WASH, that creates a, a basic misunderstanding. And so maybe we should run a prize to figure out if there's some other way to talk about systems change um, r rather than systems, because I think we're going to have this confusion for a long time. Thanks, Lewis. Um, are there any other comments or reflections based on um, any of the statements or comments that anyone has made so far? Wait, wait, I would add to that, Ellen, that if anybody hasn't seen Patrick Moriarty's uh, TEDx talks on, on uh, systems blindness, I would recommend that they take 10 minutes and watch it. Uh, Angela, did you have a question? Yeah, I think another difference um, in the health sector compared to the WASH sector is that people are a little bit more used to interacting with the health sector in different ways. They're familiar with doctors and hospitals. They're familiar with the need to buy medicines at a pharmacy. And I think that a single stakeholder um, may have more interactions with the health sector compared in the UK, for example, compared to the WASH sector in which many stakeholders are isolated and with the way in which they interact. They are an engineer they do prepare budgets or they are a user. And so I think increased visibility about how the WASH sector works as a system is also helpful in, in getting people to think about the different components and factors and actors involved. Thanks, Angela. Um, there's a comment and question from Jenna Davis from Stanford. She's in a noisy place, so I'm gonna read on her behalf. Uh, she said, thanks to Harold for the nice overview. One thing I didn't hear was the comparison of the frame um, in the comparison of the frameworks is the objective of, of the measurement exercise. Um, who are the who is the data for? Um, if we're interested not in just the system monitoring but monitoring system strengthening, um, it seems that we would want these frameworks to generate information that's useful for local decision makers at a minimum, and ideally to strengthen the capacity of local actors to collect, analyze, and act on their own data. To what extent is um, an explicit objective um, of any of these frameworks, or are their tools, um, or are these tools primarily for donors or other external partners? So I don't know, Harold, if you want to just take a first stab at that. Sure. No, thanks. It's a good a good point to raise, and I think on balance it's probably a mix. But for the for the most part, most of these really if we're very very honest and and transparent about it are for the development partners or the donors that develop them i mean that's at one level yes it's a contribution to more of a sector uh, a sector capacity to do this kind of work and i suppose you could argue that the the, the sdas the cso frameworks of the world bank <clears throat> in theory are but in a lot of cases in practice i know that they're basically done by consultants that are you know, come in, do the work, um, uh, and leave the report. That's a, you know, that's rather a caricature, perhaps. But most of them, I would say, do are driven by the development partners, and that raises a broader concern. You know, should we be looking at these at all? Uh, thinking about the things like the Washbat, which is a very much a framework driven by UNICEF, and at, at one of the sessions on reviewing that for look coming up with the second version of the washbat you know i asked the question is what is the ultimate goal of this to have every country in the world with a washbat is that the you know is that the end game for this um which may have been a cynical question but i think it is an important one in terms of why we're doing this uh, and it yeah it's perfectly valid if we're doing it for ourselves to understand the work we do better but i think there is that link um, and we didn't to answer your first question jenna we didn't actually record that so that's a good point to uh, you know we could go back and try and take a stab at, at, at interpreting that um so some of them will be more particularly at the local level perhaps the ngo ones the the what water aid district sustainability tool the water for people tool i'm sure those are shared <coughs> closely with district level partners um, but it, if you're really talking about the driver for developing these, then it, I would say in large part it is the the organizations behind them. That's my view. Great, that's it. Alan, can I jump in? Yeah, please go ahead, Lewis. 
Well, I, having just been in a couple of countries with water for people and at the, the local level, um, I, I think, Jenna, this goes back a, a bit to the, to the point on different language, uh, different needs of different people, different groups in the system. Typically, at the, the, the village or the, um, the district level, the focus is on how many people have service. But at some point, that's then, are they going to keep getting service and how much is it going to keep costing us to get them service? And when you move from that discussion of not just what's the upfront cost, but what's the ongoing cost, how many people have service and how, how can we all afford that, including both the household payment um, and government payments. There is clearly interest in this, um, what, what we call sustainable systems um, fr from the local uh, government and, 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 and the local population. So I think it's a question of framing it and presenting it in a way that is meaningful to them and I do see, certainly uh, in the work I've seen from most recently from Water for People, that that's very much a part of the discussion. It, you know, is anybody perfect at this yet? No, but it, it's, it definitely should be part of um, the work that's being done here. Thanks, Lewis. And actually, that's a good segue. Kate, um, I was just going to ask you, um, I, I uh, read your comment, but um, knowing your work more broadly with Water for People, if you could just talk a little bit about that. Um, with especially the focus on the fact that the frameworks that you guys have are really for district use. If you can unmute yourself, I don't know if you if you can. Hi, Alan. It's Kim. It's Kim Lemmy, okay. and we're here as a group at Water for People, and Kate logged in. And um, so, yeah, thanks, Lewis, and and thanks, Harold, and and for all the contributions. And um, both of our both our monitoring framework the data that we're collecting on functionality and levels of service is definitely was developed and and is still the goal is to get districts to use it on their own without um our hand holding and, and i think that um, we've made some good progress in quite a few places and um, are seeing in fact one of the most recent visits i had to the field was to Nicaragua where the district officials were actually presenting the monitoring data to um, other officials and to us. And so that was really exciting for me to see that huge progress in rather than water for people's staff saying, here's what the data is telling us and this is how we'll plan going forward. It was the district officials talking through and analyzing and, and presenting the data to us, um, which I think is the ultimate goal because then without then then the need for us to continue to be there monitoring is is much much diminished and i would say with all the tools all the costing tools and um our sustainable services checklist is really a way of when when is our best way when is our best time to exit and so um that that is definitely the goal and i i think of course the donors donors all donors need that data and we do share that data quite transparently with all of our donors, um, but the goal is not to a tool for date for to the donors, but it's a tool for um, district officials to use. Thanks, Kim. That's that's a really interesting point, and I would um, I would just add to that that I think um, as another part of an ultimate goal would be that that information that you're getting from the districts is what also can be shared with donors to demonstrate progress. That it's not. <clears throat> as you say, kind of tools for reporting, but that there's also this opportunity that if the information is being collected on the system um, with government engaged and that it's a collaboration um, of um, where the information is coming from, that that's something that can be shared with donors for um, demonstration of progress. Um, I just, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, any reactions to that before I turn over? Um, we've got one in the room here. So Eddie, go ahead. Um, hi, this is Eddie Perez, and just to add to that or contribute to that, um, those of us that are uh, in the USAID world these days know that they have a new administrator, uh, Mark Green, who seems like a pretty solid guy, and uh, in his opening comments to the staff, one of the points he made that 
he felt his personal focus, and I think this administration's focus, is on reducing donor dependency. And you know that might put off some people, from, but from my perspective, that's really the, uh, the flip side of having a sustainable system that leads to sustainable services. So, um, and it's a little bit, com and so I think part of our challenge is how to say, well, more funding is needed at this point to strengthen these systems and make them more sustainable, but to show the, the roadmap or the pathway to, you know, in the medium term or so, reducing uh, donor uh, dependency but, and not make it like this is going to be forever. Great. Thanks, Eddie. Um, any other comments? Carol, go ahead. Sorry, can I just come back on what you said, Eddie? I mean, I think obviously we don't have the data and maybe that's a you know a reflection on us. But when you say more money is needed, I think that the, you know, the, the very large sums that are put into service delivery still by USA projects, if I'm not mistaken, so actually building new uh, infrastructure, I won't use the word systems because I think semantics does matter, that a very large amount of money being given in the grant form to do that versus the amount of money it costs to try and impact and strengthen systems. I don't know the answer and I don't think we have the figures, but my my hunch is that you spend, would spend less strengthening a system, which ultimately, if our theory is correct, will lead to better services, more sustained, more durable, uh, great, greater universality than it would cost to try and provide those services directly. So I think, you know, it's not quite so straightforward. Well, that was a bit of a to, I, am I on? Yeah. I was just trying to paraphrase you in your earlier comments. So thank you for clarifying. And I certainly agree with your more articulate, uh, articulate articulation of, of the of the, of your point. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of comments in the chat box um, uh, that are kind of reactions. Um, I would encourage maybe people to read those. I don't know if Angela or John want to um, jump in um, verbally, but otherwise people can read things in the chat box if they if they have the ability. Um, Angela or John, did you either of you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, sure. My, my only point about all this is, um, you know, what, often what I see is, Yes, um, there's a new effort to work at district level, but it's really being heavily subsidized and supported to the extent that government, you know, offices are paid to go out and collect data on behalf of NGOs. Um, and this, you know, is is not sustainable. And, and I think that we've got to start thinking about ways to build capacity instead of, you know, instead of simply, you know, turning a, a program requirement to collect data for reporting to, um, you know, have that done by the district officials. Thanks, John. Um, <clears throat> Angela, did you want to say anything or did what you typed is sufficient? Oh, you're good. Okay, sorry. I, um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to um, take a moment to give Betsy back the, the floor for a moment to talk a little bit about TrackFin and um, more specifically about how TrackFin as a monitoring um, kind of tool is being used for policy and decision making, because I think that that's, I know it's not being done everywhere, but I think that it's an, it's an interesting, um, interesting element on the finance side. So Betsy, could you just jump in? Talk a little bit about TrackFin. Yeah, sure, Ellen, thanks for that. And thanks everyone for this interesting discussion. Um, so TrackFin has thus far been piloted in three countries and then Ghana has completed a second round and it is in various stages in probably around 10 countries at the moment um, with support from the World Bank in Tunisia, UNICEF in Mali, IRC is supporting in Mozambique and Uganda and Burkina Faso. So we're working, it's really become a great example of collaboration between development partners as well. Um, and so the idea behind TrackFin is that countries track all of the financial flows into the WASH sector. So it's looking from the government, from donors, from households, from NGOs, and it's really trying to figure out how much is being spent in the WASH sector, by who, and where is that funding is going to. And then the end result of TrackFin, the data is presented in different 
wash accounts tables, similar to the health accounts, if anyone is familiar with that. And then those that goes on to then be used by government um, officials to make better policy decisions. And at the outset of TrackFin, the government actually sits down and figures out what they're interested in. They could say like, are we have a, our rural systems being funded enough or we are interested in improving urban urban safely managed sanitation systems how much is going there so it's the idea of that um on i don't really have specific examples of policy right now because it is in the initial stages and countries are still just starting to do it but i know with health accounts um there are examples of I think it was in Rwanda where they looked at HIV AIDS programs and they saw that actually a lot of people were spending um, for those services out of pocket. And so they put to help relieve the spending burden on households, they ended up putting government money towards that. So there is great potential for TrackFin to provide evidence for the government on how to make decisions. And then that evidence can also be used by development partners to see how they're funding, to see what they should be funding, where what is already being funded in the country rather than duplicating efforts and it also is a way to bring together development partners including donors and NGOs and the government to make sure that funding is being um, efficiently and effectively spent in the WASH sector. And I'm happy to answer any specific questions about TrackFin either now or offline. Great, thanks Betsy. Um, Maybe we can take uh, just if there's one or two questions about TrackFin, we can take those now. And then um, there's a great um, point and question from uh, Fabio. And so um, we'll have him go after that. But is there any questions um, or comments on TrackFin uh, that anyone wanted to add? All right. So. I'm sure Betsy people will come back to you afterwards, but um, so Fabio, I don't know if you have the capability to open your mic if you wanted to make your contribution verbally, but if not, I'm not happy to, to kind of read it out and see if there's some responses to your question. If you can open your mic, um, you can do that now. Okay. Um, oh, perfect. Fabio, go ahead. Who's Fabio? Okay. Um, so Fabio just had a question. Um, it was related to um, uh, that there are tools and data for monitoring, but there's um, limited capacity to analyze the information and um, turn it into decisions at the local level. Um, and so I think there were some good examples um, um, that that Betsy had talked about at national level, there, you know, that TrackFin is being used for policies and decision making. Um, but some of the tools I know that um, Water for People is using is, is being used directly with for district um, local level decision making. And we um, at IRC are also using some of those as well as part of um, the process and the roadmap that we have around agenda for change. Um, uh, I'm not sure, maybe. Um, I can ask uh, Katarina or Fabio, you look like you're unmuted now. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, okay, no, I, I can uh, talk. I think uh, the noise, um, the voice is good because uh, the, the is not enough flat. Fabio, you seem to be cutting up, so, um, so yeah, Fabio, you seem to be, um, uh, your microphone seems to be cutting out, so I'm going to go ahead and mute you, but we've asked your question, and maybe we can get some responses um, from some of the people who are also on the call. So, can you hear me clearly? Okay, can you just add that? Okay, great. Um, so if I could ask um, quickly, maybe um, Katerina, can you talk about some of the work that you had done in Ethiopia um, and how that's being done directly with government for decision making? And then maybe asking water for people um, to, um, to jump in also. Um, Katerina, are you there and can you unmute? yourself and maybe talk a little bit about that work? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so we, we actually copied this approach from the agricultural sector where they've been using it uh, from even before 2000. Um, and it's very much with, indeed, I completely agree with Fabio, there's very limited capacity to analyze information and actually to then do something with it. Um, and also just have consultants coming in and out and it, well, it, it's, it's not sustainable, it doesn't work. So what we found over the, the years, and I just put a copy to a whole book about it, um, is to you do need to have a local facilitator. And ideally, this local facilitator actually lives in the district where you want that change to happen. And this is also the approach that what people is taking in their district. So it's someone that it's there and that it's literally facilitating the communication between the data and the different stakeholders, bringing government, both local and regional, um, private sector, etc., whoever is working in that specific district and that has a role to play in service provision to engage with what the data is saying and make their own decisions in their specific areas of influence. Um, it is, uh, again, it is uh, facilitated and motivated from outside indeed, but it is, uh, this is what we think is one of the key roles is to have that local facilitator um, basically making sure that the process of change happens. Great, thanks Katarina. Um, if I can ask um, Kim or Kate or someone from Water for People maybe to just jump in and talk a little bit about some of the work that you guys are doing also, because I think um, based on what you were saying before Kim and I think um, just my knowledge of the work that you guys are doing um, in multiple countries that there's um, this type of um, analysis happening directly uh, with the government um, is something that maybe isn't happening everywhere. Yeah, and it's it's definitely something that um, I would agree with all the comments. It definitely needs a lot more focus and attention. Um, and and we are doing you know Excel trainings with local governments and local staff so they can do their own analysis of the data. Um, and uh, so, so it is definitely an area of focus so we can increase the ability of that to continue on once Water for People has left a district. Um, and we want, we want them, the, the data to be as useful as possible to the users. And so I think the conversations around what data is it that's being collected, what are the important indicators to keep systems um, working over time and kind of the whole ecosystem functioning at a high level is, is definitely an area of focus um, in all of our country programs. Great, thanks, Kim. Um, so I'm gonna ask for maybe one or two last um, questions, and then we're gonna kind of move the discussion slightly to, um, uh, yeah, Angela, I'll come to you in just one second, um, but we're after the last couple of comments here, we're gonna move the discussion to what can we do now? This was a great initial discussion, but where do we go from here um, before we end? So Angela, I'll turn it over to you. Go ahead. Hi, hello, yeah, this is Ingeborg. Um, I'm here with Angela. And just a very quick comment on um, tools and Excel and whatever we you use as tools. So it's, um, it's of course not that much about the tools or the what, it's really about the how and how you use the tool and all the more the, the analytical stuff to say it like that. So it was actually more a comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think when we talk about making, you know, developing systems thinking in the sector beyond just um, in donors and development partners, but really getting the stakeholders working in the districts to think about all these different important system components and aspects of that. And so it's when that that way of thinking about it, or you know, a way that considers all of the the holistic elements, the soft components, the finance, the long-term planning for sustainability. It's really developing the um, that way of thinking, which enables people to use tools that they have and and to put their Excel tools into planning for continuing to improve and develop services independently. Thanks, Angela and Ingeborg. Um, any last comments? Just um, send a quick note in the chat box. Um, Harold, go ahead. Yeah, just a, maybe a reflection on this discussion around tools and what's used and what's not and so on. 
and I think it's great that there's experimentation and partnering and mentoring and so on. But when you actually get into the mechanics of local government services and most decentralized local governments are linked through a, some form of either ministry or administration which controls or which sets the rules of the game for their work, including the tools that they use, I think it's very important to be mindful of that link and to know what is it that they really have to do, what is the obligation of local government staff, for example, in terms of reporting, uh, and, and what, how much latitude they have for space to innovate to and to um, take on new ideas. I mean, I'm sure if they have little resources and a well-meaning NGO comes in from the outside and says, look, here's some new tools and would you like to use them and we'll train you and so on, people will probably say yes because they're, you know, they're interested. Um, but when you look at the really the specifics of it, and I say this because I've been doing some something similar in Ghana in terms of drilling down into what is really needed in terms of public administration, you'll find that that there are very specific things that local government staff have to do and report against. And you're not going to change that without tackling the system. And that, you know, that's the whole point of systems-based approaches, that you have to look at all of those different dimensions. We're talking now just about the use of tools of local government, but that applies to um, uh, many aspects of, of the work that we do. So I think it's fine. It's a good discussion to have, but let's put in a broader context and not forget that local government staff specifically do have these obligations uh, and space for innovation or not. Thanks, Sarah, that's great. And Claire added a comment here um, that um, SWA is looking at some kind of um, portal, um, some kind of tools portal that um, to shift the dynamics um, around tool selection to um, uh, basically from development partners to government. So Claire, um, yeah, we look forward to, to seeing that and what comes out of it. I think um, in the last couple of minutes that we have here, just to, I, I would ask that everyone um, type in the chat box maybe one or two ideas about um, how they would like to see the conversation continue. Um, we're gonna be sending around a survey afterwards or some follow-up, um, both with the recording from this session um, and the chat conversation also talking about some of the highlights and some of the challenges that came up during the conversation. Um, but if people could just kind of type in the chat box what they see as some, some possibilities for collaboration going forward. We think that this is a really um, good opportunity and a good um, initial discussion, but as was mentioned by multiple people, um, it's, it's great to have the discussion, but if that doesn't turn into the action on the ground um, and making sure that um, that we're monitoring the we're monitoring the system both for local decision making but also for um, donor engagement and, and global decision making as well. I think it's important that this isn't that this is action oriented and not just in a discussion. So knowledge sharing is key, but how do you turn that also into action? Um, so um, take just a couple of minutes to while I finish kind of the conversation um, here in chat um, in the chat box. But I just wanted to take a moment to thank everybody um, for joining today. Um, and then also to take a moment to thank Harold um, for the great presentation. I, we know that it um, was just a very quick landscaping that was done, but I think it's a useful starting point for the discussion. Um, so any last comments, please just go ahead and put those in the chat box. We'll leave it open for a couple of minutes. Um, but thank you very much, everyone, for joining, and we'll be in touch to continue to keep the conversation moving forward. Hello? Yes, we Hello? have, yes, if you have one last comment, I'm not sure who that is, who, uh, Fred. Oh, yeah. Fred? Yes, my name is Francis. Francis Kono from the African Development Bank. I joined in later okay. and I've been listening passively. So I just want to say I will send you my email address so that you put me in the loop in your communications. That would be great. Thanks, Francis. And we will make sure to, um, to reach out to everyone who joined. Um, so yes, you can send um, 
you can send your um, you can send me your contact information and we'll make sure that you're in the loop. So thank you everyone for joining um, and that um, we hereby conclude the webinar, um, but we'll leave the chat box open for people to provide um, some last minute things, but um, we thank you.